Hi, my name is Ian McDermott. I'm a 32-year-old man with straight, shoulder-length, golden blonde hair, glacial blue eyes, a button nose, and Cupid's bow lips. I'm wearing a gray sweater, and I'm seated in front of a chroma green background. I work as an artist and technician in the University of Maryland's Immersive Media Design Department, but before I was here, I was an educator at the Hirshhorn Museum and worked on a grant funded by Access Smithsonian, which the Smithsonian Digitization Conference was kind enough to invite me back to talk about. The aim of the grant project was to create an augmented reality device that would allow a blind or low vision museum visitor to hear the artwork within a gallery. But it doesn't mean just a description that, for example, a tour guide might give. Instead, it would offer a way to more deeply understand the composition of an artwork and how the elements within the artwork relate to each other. I called the project Synthesthesia, a portmanteau of synthesizer, as in musical synthesizer, AI, as in artificial intelligence, and synesthesia, a condition which I myself have, where sensory receptors in the brain are crossed. So. Some people, for example, may taste shapes, others may see sounds, and in my case, I visualize and feel space and time in distinct and concrete ways. I wanted to create an open source software and hardware so that any museum could implement the technology for much cheaper than a proprietary approach. Given this was an accessibility project and having first-hand experience of how museums often struggle to find funding, I wanted it to be economically accessible. The first step of the project was to create a software similar to any graphic design program, like Illustrator or Photoshop. It allowed the content creator to trace over the shapes of an image, and within each shape they could embed two audio files. One audio file was meant to describe the image subjectively. Artwork is not always concrete, it's meant to be interpreted and a tonal or musical description could provide the listener with a sense of how the color or texture or shapes might make them feel. And that sort of feeling is hard to describe in concrete words. It's absorbed more intuitively when a person views a work of art. Here's an example of tonal description using a painting by Gene Davis called Hot Beat. It's a simple painting with thick vertical stripes and a variety of bold colors. As the mouse passes over each stripe, you'll hear the octave and instrument change based on the color's brightness and hue. The second audio file was meant to give the concrete description, a verbal description, giving the listener a sense of what's literally in the painting. So if it's a figurative painting, a description of the person, or if it's an abstract painting, what shapes and colors are in front of the viewer. Here's an example of verbal description with Jimmy Suddeth's painting called Untitled parentheses, Chicken. As the mouse passes over each body part of the chicken, a verbal description plays based on where it's pointed. The chicken's neck is thick at the bottom and thins out towards the head like a bottleneck. The chicken's waddle is a thick red blob hanging down from its beak. The there is a single eye smack dab in the chicken's head. Two white, broken, blobby strokes of clay form an outline of a circle. Which The chicken's comb, the red mohawk-like protrusion on its head, is painted in pastel red clay with strokes that look like they were created in quick upward motions. So we had a test user who was blind, Candace Jordan, try this out. And she responded, it gives me a spatial orientation. I know there's a border and there is black and there's the chicken, and it's facing to the right. And I understand the painting probably better than I've understood another painting. When viewing a painting, a sighted person is able to step back and see the image generally, or they're able to step forward and see the finer details of the painting. By seeing how all of the elements of the painting relate on these different levels, that may affect the meaning that the viewer takes from the painting. So the content creator could activate different shapes at different levels of zoom, or how close a viewer might be looking at the painting. And the user of Synthesthesia 
could then zoom in on different levels of detail in the painting and hear different descriptions based on that level of zoom. So once the file was fully developed, it could be exported as its own file type, and that file could be imported into the hardware device that accompanied the software. Before smartphones took over, museum visitors could often check out audio guides, and these audio guides would allow a visitor to go up to a painting and hear a deeper description of the painting to better understand it. So inspired by this idea, I came up with a device that a user could check out and point at paintings, and the device would recognize the paintings using artificial intelligence, and that would activate the audio experience. So I designed a custom handheld that would house a Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi had an attached accelerometer and camera. So it was essentially a smart camera. And a user could check out the device, point it at a painting, the Raspberry Pi would run an object recognition algorithm, and it would recognize the painting and load in the content that was created in the Synthesthesia software. By tilting the device, it was like a user was pointing at different aspects of the painting, as if you were tilting a laser pointer to point at the details. Only it wasn't actually pointing to specific aspects of the real painting, it was a virtual representation of the painting from the Synthesthesia file. And wherever the device was pointed, a description would be read. So if the user pointed up at the corner of the painting and then made their way down, they would start to understand how the composition was laid out and how different elements within the painting related to one another. And by physically being able to feel their way around the painting, a user could much better grasp what is going on and how everything relates. So as a research grant, all of this felt very successful. We had good user feedback, the approach seemed solid, and a lot of the interesting ideas came out of it. Unfortunately, by this time, implementation was a bit tricky. It was February of 2021. Many of the museums were either closed or still just getting back on their feet, so testing would be complicated. The grant money had all been spent, and my contract with the Smithsonian had ended. But I'm not one to give up on a good idea, so I've continued the research on my own and am in the process of reformatting the Synthesthesia project in a potentially more accessible way using holograms. This past fall, I was introduced to an augmented reality headset called the HoloLens 2. The HoloLens 2 is a professional grade augmented reality headset, and it's maybe not necessarily economically feasible for the museums, at this point in time, but it's a good place to start as we see more augmented reality being implemented and augmented reality glasses might be more prevalent in the coming years. Though the technology of these augmented reality headsets that we're seeing more and more of is proprietary, the approach can still remain more open source because the files, instead of being created in a custom software can be developed in Unity, which is affordable, and there are plenty of resources to learn how to use. So I've started redeveloping the Synthesthesia project using Unity and the HoloLens. Many of these augmented reality headsets use a technology called LiDAR, which allows for volumetric capture of a space, essentially capturing the space in 3D. And by being able to capture the space in 3D, this opens up the opportunity for in-gallery navigation. So here you see a video I took while wearing the HoloLens. And as I walk down the hallway, a mesh is superimposed over top of what I'm seeing through the lenses. And I can point to that virtual mesh and the headset will be able to calculate how far away my finger is from the physical space it's superimposed on. And so you could have some sort of audio feedback, whether that's a sound like Doppler or a verbal distance of how far the user is away from different objects, people, and architecture. These augmented reality headsets offer object detection or QR code detection. And that will allow the user to identify the artworks that they are facing. So once a work of art is detected, 
we can then create a hologram in front of the viewer and this hologram acts as the synthesthesia file did where a user can take their finger and the headset will recognize where their finger is pointed and depending on where their finger is pointed in the hologram they can hear the details of the artwork. So to wrap up my presentation, here's a quick demo of that. I haven't yet implemented the object detection, but the idea is that a user would point their head towards a painting at a safe distance and a hologram would load in front of them within arm's length. Of course they wouldn't see the hologram if they're blind, but the headset would be essentially seeing the hologram and their interaction with it and relaying the interaction through the headset speakers. So here's a later version of the Davis painting with the tonal descriptions. And you can imagine that this sort of utility can expand beyond just accessibility into museum education. With a sighted user, for example, you could create an educational experience where they interact directly with a hologram of the artwork to have a deeper understanding of the real thing. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I'd like to give a big thank you to the Smithsonian Digitization Conference and to Beth Zebarth, the rest of the Access Smithsonian team, and the Smithsonian Accessibility Innovations Fund, which funded this project. I will now be taking questions live. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted there. Hey everyone, I am here to take questions. Uh, so first question, are there specific exhibits in the Smithsonian Museums you would like to apply these techniques to? Nothing specific because this project was developed with arts art in mind, I would, uh, the intention was to implement it uh, inside one of the art museums. So I had worked for the Hirschhorn and uh, I was hoping to implement it in an exhibit, but during the pandemic, the Hirschhorn was one of the museums that was extra shut down uh, for a longer amount of time. Uh, but I would also consider uh, the Portrait Gallery uh, or American Art Museum. Um, I know they do a lot of accessibility at those museums, and I think it would be great to implement it there. Um, but yeah, not, it, there wasn't ever, because of the pandemic, there wasn't ever a specific exhibit that it could be implemented in. And that's also not to say that it couldn't be implemented in, say, the American Art Museum, where you have historical artifacts, uh, because this could be applied wherever you have visuals. It's all just meant to translate visuals into audio, and you could do that in any museum, really. Uh, what are the challenges ahead, other than cost? Um, the challenges are really just, yeah, putting in the hours uh, of research and development. Uh, luckily, this method, this new method I'm attempting seems to be a lot easier than just writing the code itself. So I'm using a game engine called Unity. And essentially I'm creating game objects like you would see in a video game. And uh, it's all a matter of taking that object and uh, telling it when my finger touches this virtual object, detect a collision. So when you're playing a video game, if you throw a ball and it hits a character or something, that's called a collision detection. And this is sort of the same functionality you would find in that video game. And it's very easy to do because this gaming engine is built for that. And so your uh, AR headsets are being developed so that they can detect uh, your hands. And so it's all a matter of detecting when your hand collides with the object and then you just play an audio file. And so that's all very simple. And uh, I've only just begun, you know, redeveloping the project, but it seems to be 
fairly straightforward. So really, uh, the question was, other than cost, what are the challenges? But really, I think the cost is the main thing and just finding people that will take the time to do this. Can you explain the process of developing the taxonomic terms for describing the physical appearance of the work? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a matter of, specifically for, for art, uh, it's a matter of close looking. So really you're trying to describe um, in as much detail as you can what you're looking at. And uh, so you take into account things like color, shapes, just like your primary art 101, design 101 types of aspects of a work of art. And then if, for example, you have a figurative work, you try and describe it in explicit detail, uh, what a person's face might look like or how their body is shaped or how their body is uh, positioned. And so you're really just trying to break down. There isn't a specific method. It's just a matter of close looking and considering how this will translate to someone who can't see. And so some blind users may have had sight and describing colors is helpful for them. But some blind users have been blind since birth and they still appreciate uh, hearing what kind of colors because you'll still have a picture in your mind's eye of what you're looking at, even though it may be subjective if, for example, you've never seen a color. So it's really just a matter of uh, trying to be as explicit as you can about what you're seeing and bringing it down sort of as an art viewer, uh, which I had a lot of practice uh, <laughs> as uh, being in an art museum. Uh, have you worked with non-Western works, such as those from First Nations communities, which employ terms less familiar to the audience? I have not. Uh, I just collected sort of like a test set of images that uh, I tried to keep it diverse, so you would have more graphic, solid, blocky colors in some of the images I used, and then I tried to find more figurative stuff, because I was just trying to find a uh, a good span of uh, different types of aesthetics, uh, but I would definitely be interested in looking into First Nations works and also, you know, any culture. I think uh, finding and exposing people to the terms of other cultures uh, would be super enriching for this project. And uh, like I was said at the end of the uh, opening video, this doesn't have to just be an accessibility tool. It could be an education tool and you could actually see uh, a sighted viewer would see the holograms and that could lead to a more enriching experience with the art. And then you could also learn some new terminology that uh, you might be unfamiliar with. Uh, how long did these projects take? How many staff and what skills? Uh, so I was essentially the only staff working on this project. Um, and uh, it, the grant lasted for two years, but the bulk of the work took place like during the first year of the pandemic. Um, and so it like, it was six months straight of just focusing on this work, uh, on this grant. And uh, my skills, I have a weird set of skills. Uh, my background is in art. I just have a BA in studio art. And, uh, but I've worked as a digital artist and know how to program. And so the real skills you need are like being able to work in virtual 3D, like as in a 3D modeling program, being able to develop uh, in um, a video game engine and being able to code uh, just a little bit. But I'm trying to make this more accessible. So the hope for the future is to start putting out tutorials on how you make these files and can implement it in your device. Uh, because it's really not that big of a learning curve. Uh, if you can just break it down to these steps, which you can with Unity, because Unity is fairly straightforward. And so, I believe even if you're not practiced in uh, art programming and virtual space, uh, I think it can be broken down so that anyone could use. And so that's sort of the goal as I continue to develop this because uh, it's an accessibility project. And so I want it to be also accessible to learn and implement even if you don't have the skills from the get-go. 
Um, would there be a way to apply this to the musical instrument collection? A description of the instrument sound, a description of what the instrument sounds like. Absolutely. Uh, as I said before, you're essentially playing a pre-written audio file. You can also make synthesized sounds. Um, but yeah, you can have a pre-recording of an instrument and then you could uh, just load that into the virtual object, the hologram that you're making. And you could even program the keys of an instrument to react to your fingers. So if you had a trumpet, for example, you could have it look at your fingers, see when your fingers press the individual buttons, and then you could be playing a virtual trumpet, which is something I hadn't considered until this question. So thank you for that. Have you thought about approaches to sonification other than triggering discrete audio samples, real-time audio synthesis, for example? Yeah, that's what I um, was sort of getting at in the previous question. So the original idea behind the program was when I was just developing it from scratch without uh, using the Unity game engine. The idea was to take things like the colors of a painting and use audio synthesis to translate that. So I did come up with a few working examples that weren't in the video recording because I was trying to keep it short, but you could have your camera detect, you know, this is a red color and have that, for example, for those who are familiar with audio synthesis, have red represented by a square wave and have green represented by a saw wave and blue is represented by a sine wave. And then you can have, you know, your in-between colors with, uh, you know, have different effects, use different effects to describe different things. So darker colors could have more reverb, for example. And uh, yeah, in case people don't know, audio synthesis is um, taking one signal and converting it to another. So in this case, color would be that signal. And when you're programming graphics, you have numbers, you can number it zero to one for like darkest color to lightest color. And you can take that zero to one value and turn that into another audio signal, whether that's pitch, volume, tone. Uh, so there will be a process of reworking this project to handle that in Unity because it will be a matter of using some other library uh, to do the audio sy synthesis. Uh, in the original one, I was using a specific library to do that synthesis, but I was writing that in Java. So now we got to find something else, but it should be doable and it should be relatively simple for someone that knows audio synthesis. How do you get the rights for the music you use to enhance the artwork, or do you create your own? So yes, uh, all of the examples I made, I created the music uh, my own. I did make a parody of, uh, the, I, one of my example posters was a Woodstock poster for the concert, Woodstock. And at Woodstock, Credence Clearwater played, and so I made a parody of uh, one of their songs but swapped out the lyrics for descriptions of the lyrics. So that was just an example where I was being playful, using parody to get around copyright uh, and uh, making it a little more fun. And uh, so, yeah, it, the other skill set that I guess back to one of the previous questions you might want to have is to be a musician or have some sort of mu music theory background. Uh, and I'm also, I do a bit of music myself, so that came natural to me and I do a lot of digital music. So I was writing it all digitally and then exporting it. And sort of like if you've ever played a video game, uh, like Breath of the Wild, for example, if anyone knows that game, where you're moving through the game and the music is morphing, depending on where you are in the map, you're using looping methods where you're looping instruments and you'll, you're fading them in and out depending on where you are in the map. And so that's sort of the idea where your artwork now is the map and where the viewer is looking or pointing, that's when you start looping music in and out. So it's a fairly simple concept, but uh, yeah, you would need either uh, music background, composition background, or again, you could use musical synthesis to generate this automatically. Uh, and then there are also experiments using AI to generate music, and that could be another route that this could potentially take in the future. And so it looks like we may be out of questions, but uh, are there any more? We've still got time.
All right. In the meantime, I can uh, talk about where this project is going now. Um, so I'm currently working at the University of Maryland uh, in the immersive media design department, which is a new major that involves things like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, just new technology that use that applies aesthetics in different ways. And so I am planning on continuing this as a research project in my position. I'm research staff there. And so the semester is pretty uh, heavy right now, but uh, once the summer comes, I plan on re-engaging with this project and continuing. And so if anyone's interested, uh, I will leave my email in the comment comments and uh, feel free to reach out and I can keep you updated on where this project is going and uh, how it's progressing, any potential tutorials I might have. Uh, and if you are curious about other things, uh, feel free to ask more questions. And so that's imcdermo at umd.edu. Any other questions? Am I aware of similar projects elsewhere? I'm uh, not aware of any projects that are like specific to this using holograms for accessibility, but the augmented and virtual reality realms uh, are really energized right now. And there's a lot of interesting projects coming out. Uh, so I'm sure in the next few years, we're gonna start seeing more applications like this uh, coming out, more experimentation. It's sort of a Wild West scenario where it, it feels a bit like the early days of the internet where people, there was this creativity uh, and experimentation happening and that seems to have carried over to augmented and virtual reality. So I expect at some point I'm gonna start coming across similar projects to this. I am familiar with a few projects that uh, do audio synthesis with color uh, like that, and that was part, part of the inspiration behind this. Uh, but yeah, nothing specifically like for a museum uh, where you're using holograms and uh, pointing around to here where you're pointing. And another question. What other organizational partners, if you could dream really big, would you like to see come together on a project using this technology? I don't know if I have any specifics. I mean, all of your major tech companies seem to be getting into the augmented reality space. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that <laughs> we'll be seeing, you know, a lot more development with those areas. I don't want to name any specific companies. Um, but uh, yeah, my focus is more on education. So I'm more interested in using this uh, in museums and universities uh, with more of an emphasis on the educational aspects and not so much profit because I believe accessibility, you shouldn't have to like pay a crazy amount of money for accessibility and there should be motivation to make the world more accessible. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, I took this on because it seemed interesting to do and I, I'm not that interested personally in money. So I just wanted to try it because it's interesting. It's an interesting experiment in empathy where you are trying to relay something to someone that's not able to experience it themselves. And so, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily about finding big name partners and a lot of money with a lot of money uh of course you know i would accept it for research purposes but uh the focus is more just on the accessibility and the research uh and making things better all right and so i think that's my time thank you everyone